Welcome to Band Book Club. I'm Nick, this is Thomas, and today we're going to be talking about Fight Club, specifically the book and movie versions of Fight Club. And just a quick introduction for Thomas here. Thomas is a dear friend, a treasure trove of priceless information, <laughs> and a registered cinephile. Oh, yeah. And I understand yeah, you've, you've brought trivia. Uh, a little bit, yeah. What was some stuff I could dig up? You know, hopefully it'll uh, it'll it'll be entertaining for y'all. So, well, I think this is going to be an interesting discussion because if you want to talk about books versus movies, I think maybe with the exception of Less Than Zero from Brett Easton Ellis, I've never seen a movie by the end divert as much from the message of its source material. I think as uh, Fight Club. Wow. Okay. But um, we're gonna hash that out. We're gonna get into the weeds, into the, All right. the dirty, the, nitty gritty, the jungle so, vines. So yeah. Okay. But um, you you haven't read the book, right? That is correct. Yeah. And if I could perhaps interject with my first little dose of trivia. Oh please, please, we're waiting. Yeah, I discovered. So obviously, one of the leads in the film, Brad Pitt, playing Tyler Durden. Um, he's collaborated with David Fincher on a couple other films, uh, obviously Seven, as well as Benjamin Button. And he also had an uncredited bit part in a film adaptation of Less Than Zero. Brad? Uh, yes, yeah, he the 1987 film, that? small uncredited role, uh, some kind of like guy at a party or something, a frat guy, but hmm. yeah, so first fun fact. Oh, he's handsome. Yes. Handsome man. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, I'm very interested to hear about uh, this, this divergence between book and film. Yeah, well, just to bring you up to speed, I mean, Brad's kind of a dumb guy. I think he's a great actor. But mm. I mean, one of the things he really brought out in the movie was the aspect of Tyler where he's just so super cool at first. Mm. But yeah. this, this is the turning point for the movie and the book is... okay. In the movie, you're kind of rooting for him the whole time. And um, you're almost disappointed at the end where, um, you know, he doesn't get away with everything he wanted and like resetting society back and liberating everybody. But the book goes just a little bit further than the ending scene of the movie where the buildings are coming down. Okay. And um, you find out that it wasn't um, the Edward Norton character thwarting Tyler by um, shooting himself in the head. Mm -hmm. um, instead, the buildings don't blow up at all. Mm -hmm. And it turns out just to be the result of Tyler's own incompetence. Like, he just mm -hmm. ends up uh, mixing the explosives wrong. Huh. So it's kind of this... Um, sort of undercuts. It kind of, like, takes the piss out of his whole deal there. And then the, the final scene of the book is the most important because... Hmm. It shows you uh, the Edward Norton guy in an insane asylum, mm, mm. and um, he doesn't end up getting the girl like mm. he does at the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah, although I suppose that's ambiguous. They do hold hands, but yeah. yeah. But he's um, he's in this insane asylum, mm. and he thinks it's heaven. Oh wow! And uh, he, you can, you get the sense that he's still pretty miserable. That um, this whole alter ego of his ended up defeating him instead of like in the movie like taking him on this one like wacky fun ride <laughs> and um he thinks he's in heaven and the last thing we get is um one of the orderlies is kind of winking at him that he's you know waiting he's part of project mayhem and uh, waiting for him to come back oh, wow. so totally different yeah messages there yeah yeah much more explicit kind of condemnation and and um I don't know, a painting, kind of a pathetic portrait of, of, of the group and their activities and their, their ethos. It, it ended up being more about, you know, this whole psychological process for this guy mm. was just a big implosion and ended mm. up making his life and everyone else's life worse. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and, and as far as um, differences between uh, uh, original novel and film adaptation go... One comparison that jumped out to me, and, and let me know if you guys touched on this in your main episode, uh, was uh, Fight Club versus Clockwork Orange. 
and the changes that happened from book to film. Uh, and, and it seems like, spe- especially regarding the ending, uh, the final sort of chapter, and how that affects the overall thesis of the film. I haven't read the Clockwork Orange book in like 10 years, so yeah, and I don't remember the difference. Well, and so that's the thing is that uh, depending which edition of the book you got, there might not be a difference. So oh, really? I, yeah, if I recall correctly, you know, Anthony Burgess wrote, wrote the novel, and when it was um, published in the, U- in the U.S., they cut off the last chapter. And the last chapter is uh, Alex DeLarge, the main character, having gone through his whole experience being this horrible, delinquent, you know, criminal guy, uh, getting put in prison, going through this brain therapy that, you know, forcibly denied him uh, from doing, you know, evil or, or violent acts by, by uh, you know, causing this, this sick reaction, you know, and all that. Um, but, you know, this sort of artificially enforced, ah. right, exactly, <laughs> you know, corrupted his beloved Ludwig van, um, and, but, but enforcing this artificial uh, morality on him, which I understand that's kind of the clockwork orange is the idea of like, you know, man's morality, man's free will being this, this uh, natural fruit, you know, this God's creation. And then what they do in the plot is they try to engineer an orange. They try and make an orange out of clockwork. But, but what I remember from the movie ending is that he ends up pretty much okay. Like yeah. he's like eating snacks in a hospital bed with a smile on his face or something, right? Right. There's a big uproar uh, about the procedure that was done to him. He becomes like, you know, a, a cause celebre. And um, so and what's the difference with the book? Yeah, they remove uh, they remove his, his, his affliction or whatever. So in the book, that all happens. But then time continues on, life continues on. There's, I think, maybe a time jump. He's uh, sort of separated from the droogs. He's walking down the street one day and he uh, discovers one of his droogs uh, in a cafe going on a date with a girl who's sort of clean cut, dressed like a normal person. And he, and he sort of goes in and says hi. And it's like, oh, wow, yeah, it's like, you know, old times and all that. And basically Alex grows up and, and becomes more of a normal person. And uh, I think it, there was a, a, an essay from Anthony Burgess about... Um, how uh you know one of the ideas he wanted to explore is how much easier it is to destroy than to build uh but as you grow old and and maybe more mature and hopefully become a more moral person you realize the value of of building and creating you know even though it's much more laborious and and less sort of immediately gratifying you know yeah well that that ending changes everything like in fight club but i kind of feel like now since you told me that it's it's the same as the you know, Edward Norton shooting himself in the face thing, it just kind of undermines the whole mm. point of the book almost. Right. And not that they're not both very entertaining, yeah. good movies, or maybe you don't think so, we can get into that too. <laughs> but, um, no, yeah. And, and I think too, I mean, the kind of um, sympathy the movie lends to Tyler is maybe the the door for all this uh, memification of him and like the sigma male right. fetishism of him and yeah, um, yeah. in a way that doesn't really hold water from a reading of the book. Mm-hmm. And and in both cases, I think the book's ending are kind of more optimistic. Exactly. Yeah. Than uh, the movie, maybe but, uh, more conventional. Uh, people might argue they might find it more. Um, uh, less interesting if they're kind of like really looking for like an edgy cynical thing but yeah more more optimistic more humanistic uh, more to digest but in the end like you know yeah. more value and right. it, but that's the tricky thing with movies because i think one factoid i remember about the movie was they had written it that way in the original script with the um, insane asylum mm. scene at the end mm-hmm. for fight club and one of the producers or somebody just said um you know, the way we've got Tyler in this book, he's um, killing people. He wants to, he's destroying all this stuff, which they de-emphasize in the movie. But mm. they said, um, we need to make him more of a um, relatable character. So we can't have him doing, you know, some of the murder stuff that he does in the book. Oh, really? Okay. And um, more reprehensible stuff. Uh, they go into more explicit detail in the book, huh? Yeah. And they even changed the final goal of Project Mayhem from... Um, like killing a, a bunch of people hmm. in these buildings and destroying a museum oh, wow. to something they thought people could get more on board with, which was uh, resetting the credit card 
uh, company's computers. Right, erasing all this consumer debt. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty radically different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's they made him the hero. And that that's what I'm saying is like, I understand why people, especially if you don't read the book, it's like the same thing with, well, maybe a little different than American Psycho, but looking just through the lens of the movie, you can almost see why people would like... Uh, I don't know, deify yeah. this this character. Right, right. Especially young, confused guys. But Yeah, and, and just something about it, it's sort of like the 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 Francois Truffaut quote about war movies. Like, you know, there's no such thing as an anti war movie because the cinematic form and the cinematic language will always inherently glorify it and make it sexy and make it look attractive in some way. And and that sort of same axiom can sort of be applied to this case where just like him looking good on film is going to have some kind of attractive power and 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 some kind of seductive element, you know, and that's sort of this this tension that has to be negotiated. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really interesting how the 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 degree of parallels that I see at least between Clockwork Orange and Fight Club, where there were um, significant changes to the end of both uh, stories uh, when they were adapted to film. And then as a result, both films were very controversial and there was a lot of outcry and fear of like copycat crimes and so on. Um, and in the case of Clockwork Orange, there was, I, I believe, at least some kind of alleged copycat crime. And then uh, this is sort of apocryphal, uh, but I feel like it's probably pretty a pretty safe bet that there were a lot of like teenage fight clubs that, that sprouted up. <laughs> well, that's one thing um, Chuck talks about in the afterword of the book is mm. that uh, that was kind of a phenomenon, yeah. especially after the movie. There were even women fight clubs. Oh. But he also qualifies that saying that there are um, so third world sort of societies that have been doing this since time immemorial too, stuff like that. Yeah, like just, sure. uh, you know, men congregating over... Um, Blood sport. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a thing that's always been around because it's, it's kind of a natural part of men's development in some ways like this mm. integration of violence and he was saying like the original impetus for starting the book a big part of it was you know there was all this stuff in it if we're talking movies in the 90s where um women were coming together doing pretty much the same thing they were bonding mm. and having this communion but it would it was like the yaya sisterhood <laughs> or like sister of the traveling si pants. that too <laughs> and um he said the only other thing that was really like that maybe was Dead Poets Society mm. or um, in larger culture, golf. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, amongst the upper strata, perhaps. Yeah. You know, the, the ownership class or, or the executives or what have you. Yeah. Which I feel like, yeah, if, if you want to take maybe like, a, I don't know, like sociological angle to it, you could sort of... Um, maybe attribute that to sort of like the breakdown of, of community and community organizations, you know, people kind of gathered either in, in, a, in, a, in a, a local kind of setup, you know, in neighborhoods living together um, uh, with community organizations, community balls, or like, you know, mass political movements that kind of breaking down this sort of general atomization. Everyone is sort of like an individual siloed consumer and all that. Yeah, we're, well, I guess, depending on where you come from, I think it's, maybe kind of a healthy reaction to this new weird kind of isolation that yeah. people experience in i guess post world war 1 western life yeah and i mean yeah the, the the changes and the trends that have sort of just been accelerating you know over the past 50 to 100 years um yeah i mean sort of there there's there's this notion that a lot of uh uh, kind of dysfunction on that that people exhibit or, or or excessive coping behaviors are perhaps you know fairly natural responses to just the conditions of modern life you know and, sure and, and insanity is sort of a, uh, to be expected almost yeah definitely and I, I kind of had this back and forth with Rafi on the book episode but we were saying part of the experience of reading this book was wrestling page to page between feeling like oh this is kind of this kind of sounds like a cringe edge lord. Uh, 4chan reddit guy or something <laughs> like the writing almost we would oscillate between that and you know what i am actually pretty pissed off about like how much time i spend uh looking at stuff online like shopping and yeah. you know fetishizing stuff yeah 
but the where we ended up landing on you know is this cringe edge internet stuff or like is this no is there something more going on here hmm. is that there was more going on mm-hmm. and that uh this anger that was being expressed in the book wasn't just a whiny teenage anger but it, mm-hmm. it was a righteous anger at uh neoliberalism pretty much yeah and that's something i think that um the author talked about explicitly maybe in the the afterword of the book or somewhere i remember him saying is part of it is just a a slam at neoliberalism now we're drifting a little more towards politics Mm -hmm. just a uh, quick qualifier here i know you lean a little more to the left Mm -hmm. far left on stuff Mm -hmm. um i don't really have any political beliefs but Mm -hmm. i think that's somewhere where you and i do have common ground yeah is that we share kind of that hatred of neoliberalism yeah you might add the word neoliberal capitalism and i'd probably agree with you there too especially in the context of this book but yeah and i I mean i just definitionally you know neoliberalism as a phase or an offshoot of uh you know uh, capitalism, you know, the, the previous dynamic of it, you know. Sure. Well, they go hand in hand. Right. Kind right. of. But, um, yeah. So, but just to wrap all that up, you, you agree, like, this isn't just a, you know, edgelord manifesto. There is, like, something you should be angry at here that the books I tapped into. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think or it's, movie. it's, um, like a lot of different um, maybe ideologies or pieces of media or, or, or polemics, it's it's kind of both. It's this edgelord thing, but it's also correctly identifying a problem. It's it it um, it derives its power and and uh, its popularity and its you know lasting cultural impact from correctly identifying something that is that is uh, troubles a lot of people. That that is a real problem that. Uh, maybe you know doesn't get sort of properly addressed in 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 mainstream culture, but then offers uh, maybe not the best solution to it. And 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 I think that's sort of this dynamic. You know, you see all these various different sort of uh, more or less radical you know uh, uh, groups and identities and movements springing up all in response to this one central problem, and they each have their own proposed solution or or their proposed diagnosis. You know, and we're talking about the book more so than the movie right because we just got through talking about how the movie pretty much throws all that away well it 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 does at the end i mean the movie has elements i think um obviously i'm, I'm not in a position to to really uh, uh do a thorough breakdown of the differences between the two but i think there's elements of that in the film i i feel like my, my take on the film was that it was um kind of very limited in scope where its complaints are, are much more about uh consumer culture um, as opposed to maybe like larger issues of, of I don't know, inequality or, or, or general suffering or whatever, but specifically about sort of the malaise of the, um, I mean, in the case of the narrator, the decently well-off young professional who just has this hollow life based on uh, consumer spending and and uh, no sort of sense of community or human bonding or warmth. Yeah, um, and, I, and I buy that, them selling that feeling for the most part of the movie. Mm-hmm. But then it's also littered with Pepsi product placement. Right. Um, and I mean, the one moment that always uh, really kind of rubbed me the wrong way uh, was uh, they're on that bus and uh, Tyler, Brad Pitt, points out the Calvin Klein ad and, you know, something about, oh, are men supposed to look like that? And then it's like, dude, that is exactly what you look like, you know? And, and he's, he's... Oh, you're right. I never even thought about that. <laughs> he's I so don't remember that cut. from the book either. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, you know, you, things get really ironic when you look at some of the kind of secondary (laughs) downstream, uh, cultural, you know, products in response to, to, to fight club. You know, I think you actually, this was some years ago now, but I remember you talking to me about, it was like the Tyler Durden workout plan or something. Oh yeah. Uh, well he's, he's got like, um, some insane fat percentage or, or this was what Brad Pitt did for the film. Maybe. Yeah. I, well, I mean, and there's kind of a funny irony to this too, but that uh, body and the image of him in that movie has become like a coveted thing amongst uh, workout people on the internet and fitness people. And there are tons of articles about how to get Tyler Durden's body. And right, it's become an aspirational uh, a brand. That yeah, is yeah. Being sold. It totally has. And 
you know, maybe those people just coincidentally want the body because they're um, going through enlightenment or whatever, like the character <laughs> in the movie. But part of me has got to wonder, like, do they, does this whole thing just get turned into, I don't know, a bigger, Absorbed an extension back. of like middle class jerking off? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's kind of the, the, the tragic fate of, of, of a lot of these things. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, uh, there, there's this sort of, you know, uh, left-wing academic author guy named Mark Fisher, uh, who, who wrote this little book called Capitalist Realism about, and one of his theses in that was about how all attempts to critique, uh, sort of the status quo, capital, capitalism, the, you know, sort of the, the, the dynamics of our society today will, uh, eventually be, you know, smoothed over, defanged, reabsorbed back into the host organism and repurposed and, and become a, a hegemonic narrative, you know, that, that, that then reifies and goes back into supporting the existing structure. Sure. And especially in the medium of a movie, just by nature, mm -hmm. you've got, um, all these sexy stars, you've got to advertise it. Right. You've got to appeal to like the basic person who would go to a movie. All the things that the book is like kicking at the whole time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, but yeah. it, I think it all comes back to the ending of the book versus the ending of the movie. Mm. And I mean, what it what it really reminds me of. Have you ever read Paradise Lost by John Milton? I have not, unfortunately. It's on my list, though. Well, the the whole book is kind of structured as a joke on uh, these same types of readers that you would, or watchers that you would have for Fight Club because mm. the book's main character is Satan. And nice. no one can read the first um, two-thirds of this book without thinking that Satan is the coolest guy that he's got. <laughs> of course, like, he's cranky. Like, mm. there's this jerk over him that's telling him what to do and mm. things got to be like this and this. And mm -hmm. he's this dumb, like, dogmatic guy. And Satan is just, you know, super interesting, uh, passionate, original. And you you cannot help but root for him he's, the whole he's time. A, he's another hero, you know, being uh, stifled by bureaucracy. Yeah. Until the final uh, act of the not the book the poem hmm. where um the john milton shows you his true colors mm. and um you're disgusted with him at first and then the the final blow is you realize oh shoot i've been mm. rooting for this guy the whole time mm. and you feel terrible about yourself and you realize oh i get what he was doing there like right this is like the he the seduction of all that stuff is yeah. exactly how it works. It has this sexy sheen mm -hmm. and you follow it to its conclusion and it's this miserable, ugly thing. Mm. And that's exactly what the book did to Tyler with mm. that last scene. Mm. But the movie just leaves him as, you know. Yeah, on this kind of note of uncertainty, of possibility, like... You know, obviously... Well, let's um, be honest. We thought he was cool. We liked him. Yeah, I mean, his outfits went hard, you know? His, oh, his sure. hair, his glasses, his his uh, devil-may-care attitude, you know? Um, he had that, like... Um, suffered no fools. That really sculpted V thing by his crotch <laughs> that the Abercrombie <laughs> models had that they show you a lot. Right. I mean, who's, who's going to turn that down? Yeah, I mean... Uh, you know, obviously mileage varies. I mean, there are moments in the film where you do really feel the bottom drop out. Um... And and I think, you know, a, a reasonable audience member could start to pull away, you know, the 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 letting go of the steering wheel, driving at night and all that stuff. And obviously once once uh, 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 Bob uh, buys the farm, you know, um, which another fun fact interjection. So uh, the meatloaf, I love these fun fact moments. Oh, yes. I got more coming. They, there's been a log jam in the pipeline. Um, so Meatloaf, uh, he wore a 90 pound harness. Uh for his um, language, I... Uh, oh, go ahead. We can always bleep it out. All right. Uh, he wore a 90-pound harness uh, to create his bits. Uh, and he also wore eight-inch lifts so that he'd be taller than Edward Norton on camera. And uh, apparently, um, I was listening uh, uh, just last night. Uh, apparently, you know, somebody wanted to get that harness, either for memorabilia purposes or, uh, or I don't know, reuse in another film or something. And Fincher said, 
that thing has been so sweat through by meatloaf. Oh yeah, they wanted they wanted, <laughs> they wanted to take it uh, for some kind of like one of those Hollywood meatloaf sweat. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Um, that's something to be reckoned with. Um, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. R.I.P. Um, <laughs> but um, they they wanted like one of those um uh, like Hollywood memorabilia restaurants wanted wanted to to acquire that harness. Uh, and apparently Fincher said that thing has been sweat through to such a degree. There's no way it would be legal to have it anywhere near, uh, you know, food, <laughs> any kind of uh, food service area. But, um, yeah, so that's a little meatloaf detail. Well, they could, uh, take the cue of the book and dip it in somebody's soup. That's true. Which, yeah. So, uh, you know, apparently a lot of, a lot of the, uh, a lot, a lot of details in the plot, um, I, I was listening to a little bit. I, I didn't get all the way through, sadly, but a little bit of uh, uh, Chuck Palahniuk's uh, commentary along with Jim Ools, who uh, co-adapted the screenplay along with David Fincher. So it was Jim Ools and, and Chuck Palahniuk on, on, the, um, on the commentary. And Chuck was saying how so many elements of the plot uh, were pulled from his own experiences or those of his friends. And he was saying how, yeah, there were friends of his who were doing these, you know, acts of, of stochastic terrorism in, in, in the food service industry, messing with the soups and all that, and a friend who was inserting reels in, into, uh, into the film, uh, you know, as a projectionist. That's why I always try to tell a, a lot of my associates are Greek people, mm. and sometimes, a lot of the times, they'll air, like, every complaint they have to waiters. And I, I just want to reach out and shake them, <laughs> like, you're eating c- <laughs> <laughs> Or boogers. We'll bleep that part and we'll use that. Oh, but uh, oh man, yeah. Well, that's no. It's definitely a real thing. Yeah, and that's you know, um, e- even in the absence of any kind of like really organized, disciplined, militant kind of sort of you know class uh, antagonism or or class movement, you still get these individual acts of rebellion and and whatnot. Uh, just individual people, you know, flipping the bird, you know, like the whatever Eminem lyric, but uh, from the real Slim Shady. But um, yeah, I mean, earlier you you were touching on, you know, uh, the ways that the film, you know, only reinforces consumer culture and whatnot. And I think, you know, we've talked in the past over the years, you know, this movie's been a part of our lives for a long time uh, about kind of the the contradiction uh, and the the problem with, uh, you know, trying to adapt the themes of the Fight Club story in a film, which is part of the studio system, which is getting all this financing and supported, you know, by product placement, possibly. Um, and there was an, actually a quote from Fincher that I found kind of interesting, uh, which I feel like sort of addresses that or at least continues that, that sort of dialogue. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay, uh, here I have it. It'd be like trying to release a movie version of Das Kapital or something. Yeah, which I in mean... the American movie system. Yeah. Well, not to go on a tangent there. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, finish your thing. Yeah, I mean, there's... but And, you know, there's... there. I mean, there... Uh, what is it? Uh... Warren Betty did that movie Reds, and uh, there was the. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I mean either, but I, I want to. And and the um, the uh, um, Judas and the Black Messiah about Fred Hampton. Um, I haven't but, seen it. Either. Yeah, but there's there's there, there is an inherent sort of tension that that has to be sort of navigated. But but Fincher talked about the the process of of the. Um, uh, the film really, you know, getting rolling and him him getting on board with making the film. And sort of the background was, uh, you know, his first feature film after doing music videos and, and uh, commercials, ironically. Uh, <laughs> a lot of commercials. Uh, well, there's no ethical consumption under uh, capitalism. Right? <laughs> that's, that's what some people say, yeah. Um, I love, that's one of the best trap doors ever. <laughs> um so he his uh, Fincher's uh, debut film was Alien Three. Uh, really, I didn't know that. Yes, and it was a terrible experience for him. So I only real quick, I only saw the first Alien. That's one of the ones where it became like a big dumb action movie, right? Well, I think the the sort of consensus that I've seen about Alien Three is that it's kind of this beautiful disaster, and it's great looking. Um, but and there's hints of what could have been, but it was totally butchered uh, uh, by the studio. They totally intervened, pushed him around. You know this this new feature film director with not a lot of clout and so on. Um, and and you know um, the final product was nothing near what what he wanted. Um, and it, it's uh, it's not like Alien versus Predator. It's 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 not like this huge big dumb uh, thing. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I think it, it doesn't really work. But you know, it's got um, Charles Dance, uh, Tywin Lannister. Oh, I like um, that guy. Yeah, it's like on a, some kind of prison colony or something. Um, so I think that there there are interesting things about it. It's this sort of interesting artifact, you know, what could have been and all that. But after that terrible experience, you know, Fincher almost wrote off uh, feature filmmaking. Uh, but then, you know, uh, he was interested in Fight Club from the jump. He wanted to buy the rights to it himself. But Fox, the same studio, bought the rights instead. And, ah, and so then he thought... That's well, kind of funny. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so one of many ironies all throughout the whole uh, saga here. But um, uh, then, you know, he got word, you know, his sort of his agents and so on were telling him, well, Fox has changed. There's new leadership. You know, you might have a better experience this time around. And so a dialogue started and sort of the options that were presented were or at least that he conceived of was he could go two ways with Fight Club. Uh, he could do a three million dollar budget, more of like a micro budget, like tiny art film. Uh, mm, get, micro. Uh, yes. Uh, get very limited distribution. Um, you know, maybe it shows in a few art cinemas here and there. Um, you know, some snob is going to find it in 10 years and say that it's an underrated masterpiece. Or maybe it'll get no theatrical release. Maybe it'll go straight to DVD. Oof. Um, or option B, uh, he gets something in the range of a $50 million budget. And in the end, it ended up being like 65, something like that. Uh, which allows him to get some big name stars and draw. Went into those CGI sex scenes with uh, Helena Bonham Carter, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, lots of CGI. I mean, he uses CGI in a, in, in a really playful and creative way. You know, no, no, no aliens and whatnot. Um, and get a larger, you know, audience and 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 uh, reach more people with. And and the word he used was uh, make it, uh, you know, make this seditious movie and get more people to see it. And he chose option B. and so, But it ended up being a flop at the box office, didn't it? Well, you see, yeah, that's the interesting thing. It was a box office flop, very polarizing reactions from critics. Uh, Ebert gave it this middling review, two out of four stars. I have several quotes from his review that I, I In found. his khaki pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it ended up... Uh, it ended up, uh, you know, recouping and, and becoming this big hit on home video. Sure, uh, a huge cult movie. Right. Right. And uh, very much situated in its specific time and place, you know, back when home video was still a big thing, you know, with physical media and DVDs and then later Blu-rays, um, you know, pre-streaming. But, uh, you know, after the advent of home video. So it's this cult phenomenon, this 90s, late 90s, early 2000s cult phenomenon that, that could only happen at that moment. Um, so but but that sort of presented, you know, this quote from him presented this interesting thought to me of like, well, if for an artist or an activist or a propagandist, someone who's trying to get a message out there to have it be received, to have an audience, is it worth the compromises that come with using the studio system, using the resources available under the current system? Is, is that still justified if you're still reaching more people, you know? And I guess maybe the direction that we're taking it with our conversation is, is maybe not because it was just sort of neutered, you know, beyond recognition. But the know. movie you mean yes yeah as compared to the book hmm i don't know because i mean i, I keep thinking about uh, going back to the book which was a great book mm. and it was this guy made it and i don't think he thought about any of this stuff it was just i don't think he was even one of these writers that gets tripped up by being more interested in the ideas that they have to say mm than um, just wanting to write a good story and pay attention to the craft of that. Mm. But this, the after effect, I guess, I so are you asking the question, does the movie work? Can it like still hold the message of that book? Well, um, or like, yeah, can you pull something like that off? Like the, a clockwork orange sort of thing? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah, like does, does, um, does making a film with a larger budget with stars in the studio system automatically disqualify it from having, um, you know, more radical potential or having a, a, a genuine, valuable critique of the status quo? Uh, I mean, is, is it is, you know, is it um, is it worth working with, you know, the things that you're critiquing in order to reach a, a, as, as large an audience as possible? I don't know. I think it depends on the kind of 
clarity of vision that your audience is going to have coming mm -hmm. to it, which probably the studio directors and people who financed this and put it together mm -hmm. didn't really care about. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I mean, we're talking about it right now. I'm I'm glad it exists and yeah. it's an entertaining movie. Yeah. But there's a downside to it too, right? Which is, I think the not treatment, but kind of the thing this movie has morphed into on the internet. Right. Kind of that, um, the same thing that's happened with American Psycho, where, um, I mean, that meme, Patrick Bateman stuff is on fire right now. And um, especially yes. with Zoomer type people, you get the sense that, um, you know, this is just like a funny, kind of cool character to them. <laughs> and uh, no, seriously, I mean, it's everywhere. And... I mean, there. I mean, this could splinter off into the whole toxic masculinity discussion, but right. there are, I think, a lot of uh, young American guys that are really hurting and really uh, lost and alienated, mm -hmm. and are just starving for an image of uh, a man with power. Mm. And uh, anything else could be attached to that, but mm. they'll, they just, I mean, I think it's in their DNA to gravitate towards that. Mm -hmm. And without all the proper qualifiers around it, like the book has, if you give it a fair reading, mm -hmm. um, that it ends up taking you in the same direction that um, the main character goes in the book, where mm -hmm. you implode. Cautionary tale, yeah. Yeah, I mean... If we want to get a little Jungian about it, mm. I mean, it that's where this is a primal story. It's just a guy who is trying to integrate his shadow self, his aggression. Mm. But, I mean, the caveats that Jung gives for that are if you don't find a... W aggression is great. Anger is great, especially as a man. Mm. But if you don't find something bigger to contextualize all of that in and kind of bridle it, it will end up eating you from the inside out. Right. Like the the narrator in the book. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, when I said the consequence, that's the consequence of making something like this into a movie, mm. is you will have a lot of... Um, people who take the wrong message. Yes. Uh, untrained yeah. people consuming this. Undisciplined. That it might end up hurting in the long run. Yeah. They become a gym bro. <laughs> they... Um, yeah. Now, there's anything wrong with that in itself, but right? Yeah, that's all, also a path to you know uh, a lot of positive outcomes. They, as well. they, yeah, they reduce it down to just like here's a tough, cool, edgy guy mm -hmm. that that uh, can beat someone up mm -hmm. and uh, is physically attractive, <laughs> and right. that's where it ends. Aspirational, yeah. But it can't end there. Yeah, and and I don't know. For me, I guess you know, sort of a lefty angle or whatever. Uh, it, it, it almost comes down to like, you know, it's this identif identification of, of, uh, of a problem of identity and, and, and community isolation and so on. Um, but the solutions proposed are still sort of confined within this very restrictive framework that's very uh, solipsistic and, and, and very focused on, on yourself as the individual and, and actualizing through this conception of masculinity um, you know, um, building yourself up by destroying yourself and others and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it, it sort of lacks a, like a, a really rigorous critique of, of the status quo and sort of like a, a rigorous and holistic analysis. And, and it, it fails to sort of envision, I mean, ironically, you know, maybe by accident in the film, I guess they end up manifesting more of a social change by, you know, erasing all the, all the debt. Uh, but but largely, you know, the idea of the Fight Club and so on is um, very much turning inward and and uh, sort of incapable of imagining a different society, building a different society. You know. Yeah, I mean, and also with the book's kind of um, angle on people, mm. I think you'd have to assume that if all those people's debt got erased, like <laughs> the average American that the book is slamming, mm. they just go and buy more. Yeah, I guess if yeah, if that's kind of the misanthropic angle that it's taking. Also, I got to add the uh, Chinese version of that uh, of the movie ends uh, with the same thing. It's like uh, instead of the buildings blowing up, mm -hmm. and this is super interesting actually. Mm. Um, it cuts before the buildings blow up, mm. and it has a text insert come on screen. It says, um, 
because of his own incompetence or something like that, he, the or buildings, the, the heroic efforts of police. Yeah, yeah, the buildings did not blow up. The police came in and saved everything. Order was restored. They that, ended up giving you the message of the book, right? Tracking with the original novel. Yeah, that, that yeah. was cute there to me. <laughs> but uh, so just to sum all that up, you you kind of agree with me, like you, it, it's it's a flawed a flawed delivery, a compromised delivery of the thesis of the book. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose if it's if it's an all right time, I can maybe deliver some of Ebert's little zingers. Oh, please. Yeah. I've been uh, thirsting for those <laughs> Ebert zingers. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, another another R.I.P., you know, <laughs> gone but not forgotten. He, he should have uh, joined the Fight Club. Yeah. That. Uh, should I make a joke about a glass jaw? I don't know. All right. So. OK. <clears throat> So Ebert, he called it fascist. He called it macho porn. Uh, he called it little boy posturing. And but he did qualify that it was very well made with a great first act. Um, and he said that it had some of the most brutal, unremitting, nonstop violence ever filmed. Which I don't know. I feel like that's a little hyperbolic. He called it a uh, masculine porn and. What was this? Posturing? Uh, macho porn and little boy posturing. Oh, I think Ebert has low T. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, well, I again, I won't make another medical joke at his expense. <laughs> um, God rest his soul. Yes. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, yeah. Uh and uh, he described how in the fight scenes, the sound effects guys beat the hell out of a sofa with ping pong paddles for the the the, the punch noises and all that. Uh, you know, homoerotic undertones. It, it, he described it, um, I guess, sort of in its moment, you know, the types of films that are being made at that point with all the twists and, and rug pulls of the audience. He said it had Kaiser Soze syndrome. Uh, I haven't seen that movie. Actually, me neither. But of course, I, I, I know what he's talking about. Uh, and... I think you'll like this. He said that Tyler Durden sounds like he tripped over the Nietzsche display on his way to the coffee bar in a bookstore. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I was kind of getting at earlier with, uh, um, you know, the page to page struggle of this book of the right. Reddit forum feeling mm, versus, mm. you know, righteous anger. Mm. But I don't know. I mean, I, I do think this book is a great encapsulation of the will to power idea from Nietzsche. Okay, interesting. I don't know how familiar you are with any of his stuff. If you were ever in middle school and wore like all black for a year, like all, I did. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think I, I didn't have that phase. No, I, I thought I would have caught that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, that's that that's one of the virtues to the, of the book to me is mm. um, the I think it does good service of that idea, which is, I think, a demonstrably real thing. I mean, Nietzsche just his thesis about all that is, you know, there are a, there's a big amorphous mass of people doing nothing. Hmm. And out of that, Jones. there's a handful of uh, Ubermensch guys who um, will go through the, the pain and the struggle to actualize themselves, accrue power, hmm. and project their uh, will and their image of the world uh, onto things until things reality is bent to hmm. that vision like the uh, nicholson character from the departed he wants his environment to be a product of him sure yeah and i i think i think this is a, a fair treatment of that okay. but um well yeah i mean you can't nietzsche is one of the most his books are extremely dense and rigorous and a another author who i think there's a lot of contention over over the heritage and the legacy and you know who owns uh, sort of Nietzsche's ideas and what what they actually mean, you know, which ideology they support, that kind of thing. Sure, yeah, but I mean, good luck to anyone who's going to try and distill Nietzsche into a movie, right? Which that wasn't even. I mean, his his books you could use to as a, like as a doorstop, right? Yeah, yeah. But the basic idea from again, I'm not a Nietzsche scholar. I've mm -hmm. read some of his stuff, but um, I thought it was a pretty good distillation of that. Okay. Well, fair enough. Well, you know. Ebert. But then again, I mean, people 
like the Reddit people, they're going to run with these one-liners from Tyler. Yes, these that, very accessible kind of... That are reductions down. of Nietzsche, I guess. you. So I guess that's maybe fair from Ebert. Yeah, and of course, he's talking about the film. So. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, just rounding it out, last couple lines, uh, you know, and, and sort of uh, truncating a little bit here. Although the film ultimately presents an argument against the behavior of Tyler... Uh, he suspects the audience will like the behavior, but not the argument. Um, and then, I think that's good. Yeah. And then the last one I got was that it's a thrill ride masquerading as philosophy. But, uh, yeah. well, I, I think I agree with the E-man on all this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he had so the juice, far. yeah. But uh, if, if we have time, if we're able, I, I didn't want to uh, uh, just dump on the film the, the, the whole time. I, I There were... Uh, some things that I really appreciated about the film, uh, just, you know, outside of its its particular thematics, was just, you know, Fincher as a director uh, being, having such sort of, you know, formal mastery and uh, and really playing with film form um, to communicate ideas and aspects of the book in a ways that only a movie can, you know, which I always appreciate. It makes it very lively. And I feel like, especially with the state of movie making nowadays, there's so many mainstream movies that are just so inert and so static and that don't really make full use of all the tools at their disposal. But but Fincher is always someone who he's, you know, there's all, so much craft and detail into all the little moments. Especially this movie. And now I'm uh, I'm dipping my toe into your lane here mm. where I don't really belong. Oh, but, well, uh, welcome. This movie has like so much motion even amongst his other stuff, which I thought was really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of like whip pans and other camera moves. And obviously, you know, Ebert, or I'm sorry, uh, Fincher, uh, he um, he kind of is, is uh, famous for his uh, uh, uncanny camera movements, you know, uh, CGI camera moves, crane operated stuff, sort of impossible camera movements, th things that had to have been, um, you know, done with CGI in some way or another because... It uh, uh, you couldn't you know possibly imagine how a camera operator could do it physically, um, and that that tells me that he must have really studied the book here hmm. before he did it because I mean that's the form reflecting content. The part of what Polanyi said the book came out of was a writing exercise he gave himself where uh, he wanted to write a short story where there was actually absolutely no uh, exposition leading up to things. It was only the cuts to action mm, mm. and the movie I, I think does a great job of that it yeah it has this frenetic uh like relentless feeling yeah constant constant motion uh, constant energy in 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 that commentary with with uh with chuck palaniuk and, and jim Uhls, they they described how the first act um to the extent that you can even cleanly separate the film into acts is basically almost structured as one in one long montage with constant like flashbacks and then flashback within the flashback and then kind of sudden jarring you know flash forwards which obviously that reflects uh, 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 the narrator's uh, fractured state of mind him losing time you know him falling asleep and, and waking up in places where he doesn't he doesn't realize what's happened and one moment that that really grabbed me that I thought was really cool is that um, Edward Norton literally gets yanked across a cut so he's in one scene uh, in fact, I think he's. Uh, it's it's the very first scene they've they've done that big ninety second you know CGI uh, uh, pull out where it starts off at the, at the microscopic level in the fear center of his brain, pulls out across all the neurons and everything, emerges out his mouth, tracks up the barrel of that pistol, and then we have the scene there. And it's in media res. Obviously, we'll return to that later in the film. Throws you right in the action, very disorienting. And then Edward Norton is standing there in frame, and he suddenly gets yanked. And then it cuts, and he's yanked into the bosom of Bob. Yeah. And, I mean, that was pretty uh, accurate to the start of the book, too. Mm. I mean, that's one thing I appreciated was you got the sense this was a director that really gave a crap about the thing he was turning into a movie. But... Um, Which is, you know, sort of why it's tragic that there were these compromises to the thematics, you know, even with his dedication. Yeah, but, I mean, I think my final thoughts on it are he did a great job... And from what I understand about the production, his hands were tied by these decisions the producers and whoever else wanted to make about Tyler. Mm. And uh, I, I don't fault David Fincher at all. I think he did the best he could with, in light of that. Mm. And he couldn't have predicted the meme 
right. diarrhea that would happen later. And yeah, the, uh, when you, know, you put something out in the world, you never know what they'll what they'll do with it. Furthering of the bondage of a young, confused American man. But <laughs> you know, who can you can uh, predict these things? Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, I guess we're we're doing we're sort of in a wrap up phase. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. I guess as a sort of closing thought for me as well. Yeah, I, I do recognize the the thematic problems, the the compromises, the uh, that that exist, the contradictions um that the film can't really resolve but i still really enjoy it just as a piece of entertainment as a piece of filmmaking craft and also just as a as an artifact historically and how it's uh, precisely situated you know in particular the fact that it feels very modern um uh, very self-aware a lot of fourth wall breaks um and yet there are changes that have happened since the film was made that date it in really interesting ways I mean, for one thing, you know, you have all this CGI and all this camera trickery and very slick stuff, but it was made in 99. It was shot on film and, and uh, you know, pre predating this transition to di digital camera and digital filmmaking. Um, and the technology of the characters, I mean, you have the Edward Norton character, you know, on the phone with the Sears catalog or Ikea or whomever ordering furniture that way. Um, that I don't think that really happens like that so much anymore, you know? No, uh, no. Predating all these digital marketplaces and kind of the, I feel like the atomization and whatnot that it addresses has just been hyper accelerated ever since then with the advent and popularization of the internet as it exists now, you know? Sure, and that, that's what I was thinking when you said time capsule. No. Yeah. It... Of course, I wasn't like a sentient adult or anything back then, but right. in retrospect, it does seem like a encapsulation of that moment and that kind of mental rabies everyone was having <laughs> at the turn of the century, right before we tipped over the edge completely and dove headfirst into the internet world. But yeah. um, you said yeah. atomized. I'm going to have to wrangle you back on here <laughs> for uh, a Michelle Welbeck episode because this was just... Uh, way too much fun yeah man I, I had a blast and and yeah so I, I need to finally read that I know it's I've 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 really let you down by not reading it yet but I, I I am going to and and yeah that seems like a perfect a perfect deadline and uh, if if I can squeeze in a closing thought it's just it's so funny how in a lot of ways Fight Club is now um, similar to its peers in this moment of malaise the the brief end of history in the in the late 90s before history started back up again with a vengeance uh, where, you know, like the opening of The Matrix, like Office Space, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of other films, like like uh, American Beauty, it's now almost this nostalgic depiction of economic security and a job with nice benefits in a, in a nice office. You know, it's <laughs> aspirational for a lot of people now who are like gig workers or whatever, you know, it's like, God, I wish I had it like they, they do, you know? But <laughs> Well, that was a lot of fun. Thank you, Thomas. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. This has been a total blast. Of course. I hope we can do it again soon. Mm. Um, everyone watching, listening, make sure you please like and subscribe. And remember, if a book is banned, it's worth reading, even though this was a movie that we we're talking about also. Yes. Well, a transmedia empire, right? Trans empire, indeed. <laughs>